on with our study of Jehoshaphat. And, and the real theme of the season, I guess, that the Lord has really put on my heart, and as I see God moving in other lives, is to have been dealing with seeking God. And uh, a while back, a few weeks ago, the Lord really put that on my heart. And, and not only me personally to really focus on seeking God, but to encourage the church and to teach the church accordingly. And so that's what I've been doing. And we've been having increased prayer time, seeking God. And the Lord is moving as a result of that. But uh, we went into 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And the Lord really just kind of touched me with the life of Jehoshaphat. Because Jehoshaphat, when we look at the life of Jehoshaphat, we find a man that's seeking God. And uh, today we're going to talk about kind of a scary word. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. Jehoshaphat proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. Jehoshaphat proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. Now I'm going to give you a really deep theological definition of fast. That means you don't eat. <laughs> Everybody said, what? That means you don't eat? That's what fasting is. And as we get into this in the next couple, three teachings on this, I will share with you what fasting does. I will share with you kind of the, the mechanics of fasting, the dynamics of fasting, why it benefits us so greatly. Amen. And the Bible speaks very specifically about the blessings of fasting. But I want you to understand, and, and we will get into the details of this, and I know some people immediately say, well, I can't do that because I'm on medication. Well, we're going to address that matter. Uh, but when you read the Bible, and it says fast, I want you to understand there's no other definition of it than you don't eat. That's what fasting means. Now, I bring that up because I know in the times we live, we've got to where we have all kinds of different fasts, and that's okay. I'm not knocking that. But when you read it in the Bible where it says fast, it doesn't mean you do without chocolate for a week. It doesn't mean you lay on Mount News for 30 days. The word fast means you stop eating. I got a shout out of them and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And you're going to find there's some really specific reasons why you fast. And so I will be doing some teaching on that. But I, I'm just going to share one thing real quick. This is totally out of context. It has nothing to do with what we're doing right now. But Sailor, will you come help me? Can you yell good? Can you yell pretty well? Hey, Zachary and Caleb, can you guys help me? Can you guys yell? Come here a second. I'm just going to give one real quick demonstration of something. Okay, come on up. Come on up. Now I'll get two of you. I only need two. We're, we're three part needs. No, I know it's tough. Come on. Right, the only thing you're going to be asked to do is yell. Okay, I think you can handle that. Okay, I'm going to share it just a second. Okay. Now, the Bible teaches us we're tripartite being, right? What do you mean by tripartite being? That means we're three parts. But it says that not we have. We are spirit being, aren't we? We're eternal beings. It says that we have a soul and we live in a body, basically. And what that means is, you know, the, the soul in that context of the scripture that I'm referring to in 1 Thessalonians is talking about our emotions, our thoughts, that part of us. And then we have our bodies, we know what this is, right? And then we have our spirit, which is our eternal being. Now, one thing I taught, and I'm not going to go into all this, we will get into more of this as we go, because this is really not the, the subject today. But I feel like I need to come with this because of the looks I got on your face when I said you're fasting means you don't eat. It's like, oh my God, now that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Let me explain something to you. Why, why that, one, one of the reasons that benefits you a great deal spiritually. We are spirit, soul, and body as, as beings, okay? God speaks to us spirit to spirit. God doesn't speak to us necessarily. He doesn't walk up to us in a body, flesh and blood, and say, hey, what's up? God doesn't talk to us that way, does he? A lot of people get confused in an area and they, and, they, and they think their emotions is God talking to them. God doesn't talk to you through your emotions. God talks to you spirit to spirit. The spirit of God witnesses to our spirit that we are a child of God. It's one of the scriptures that demonstrates that. So the number one way that we hear from God is obviously is through his word and the Holy Spirit teaching us his word and the spirit just speaks to us. Spirit to spirit. Right? Now, since we are tripartite 
means we're going to have, yeah, we'll have Sela is the flesh. <laughs> Zachary is the soul. Eli is the spirit. Okay? So, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a demonstration, okay? And I'm going to have these three yell really loud, okay? Now, when I look at you and I point at you and I begin to go like this, I want you to decrease it by until you're quiet, okay? Okay, ready? Yell loud. Yay, go ahead.
So when I'm going to deal with fasting, I just want you to understand that that's one of the key areas. There's, and let's get into this before I get out of whack. Second so Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. Proclaim the fast. Now again, we're going to look at something here at how Jehoshaphat responded to a physical attack of the enemy. And I covered this last week, but I just want to bring it to our attention again. Because what Jehoshaphat did is he responded to a physical attack with a spiritual battle, didn't he? I mean, he normally, as I talked about last week, and normally when the enemy comes against you and the enemy attacks you and multitudes come against you, what do you normally do? You start checking your military resources and making strategic moves, and, and you get, you know, uh, the maybe the other nation's leaders on the phone and start trying to have diplomatic relations, and, and you go through all of this stuff, but here he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't go and have, have military meetings. He doesn't go and, and call his generals. But he gets he calls a fast and proclaims a fast and gathers his people together and they begin to fast and call upon God. So immediately we see one of the key differences here is what he did is he responded to a physical material battle with a spiritual attack. With spiritual weaponry, so to speak. And we covered that last week, and I don't want to get into it again, but it goes on in Ephesians 6, 12, doesn't we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. So he understood that behind the attack is actually a spiritual attack. He understands that he's fighting a spiritual battle. He's fighting a spiritual warfare, and the Bible tells us that our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty to God pulling down the strongholds. So we've got to understand as God's people, one of the first lessons we have to learn in, in, in the battles of life is we are not fighting physical battles, we are fighting spiritual battles. And the way to fight a spiritual battle is with spiritual weaponry, isn't it? And, and we have to understand that because our weaponry has to match the battle. If our weaponry doesn't match the battle, it's no good. If you remember right, I taught on this a while back, and one of the illustrations I used was imagine some guy, and you know, from the time he's two years old, he studies the martial arts and prepares the martial arts, and I mean, he's learned every martial art, and he's, you know, he's a black belt and all these different things, and, and you know, he's the biggest, baddest thing alive, and he goes out here in the parking lot, and there's a guy across the street who, who threatens him with a, an M16, and he gets down into his martial arts stance, and it's not worth much, is it? Oh, he shot in the head! All of that martial arts training, all of his life didn't benefit him one bit in that battle, did it? Why? Because his weaponry didn't match the battle. And that's what it's like for us. We can, we can, we can be prepared and ready and think, well, I'm ready for this fight. But if we try to fight a spiritual battle with carnal weapons, we're like that martial artist against the rifle. I mean, it's a total mismatch. So we have to understand what Jehoshaphat is doing here. He's fighting, he's fighting a battle here. He's fighting the war, so to speak. He says, wait a second, I'm surrounded by the enemy. I better get a bit with God. I better call these people to fast. I, we better pray and fast because we're in, a, we're in a real battle here. And as God's children, as God's believers, that should be our first response. And we shouldn't, you know, and, and one of the things that I've shared with you and shared with you is one of the things we've got to learn to do as God's children to, to walk in victory is we've got to learn to fight the fight with spiritual weaponry. And, and, you know, we, we, one of the things I've seen in the body of Christ so much over the years is we, we immediately respond to the battle by doing it the world's way. We've been again to seek the world's counsel. What should I do? Without first realizing this is a spiritual warfare, this is a spiritual battle, I need to respond to this with spiritual weaponry. So we see that's exactly what Jehoshaphat is doing here. And... Uh, you know, I shared with you out of Mark chapter 4, same thing. When the word of God was sown in their heart, what happened? Afflictions, persecutions, cares of this world, lust of other things, deceitfulness of riches. All of these things that sounds like just everyday life was an attack upon the word of God. And so we've got to understand that, beloved, behind the battles of life, behind the attacks upon our life, there is a spiritual battle taking place and spiritual warfare taking place. And the only way to properly respond to that is to respond with spiritual weaponry. And so every time we're in a battle, our first response should always be prayer and fasting. Hallelujah. Everybody shout on that one. Our first response should be that. When we're in a battle, we should speak, should say, okay, God, I gotta get in prayer here. We gotta, I gotta, maybe I've got to do some fasting here. I've got to get in God's word here. In other words, I've got to fight this battle with spiritual weaponry. That's why you'll hear it from me as a pastor. I'll go, pastor, I can't come. 
come to church because of this and this is going on in my life. And my response is, that, that's a good reason to come to church. The more battles you're in, the more you need to be in church. When your life is perfect and you got it all together and you're not fighting any battles, then there ain't no need to show up here. Well, Pastor, you come out when you come to church. And yeah, because that's not going to happen until Jesus comes back. I mean, you're never going to have that day where there's no battles. You're never going to have that day. Why? Because we, we have an enemy who's, who, who's, who's wondering about seeking who we may devour. He's out to destroy us. And we've got to understand how to fight those battles with spiritual weaponry. So our first response is just like Jehoshaphat here. Boy, I need to pray. I need to do some fasting. I need to get in the Word. I love it when I say fasting. There's a certain word you can see, and you can just see the blood leave the congregation's face. <laughs> fasting means we don't eat. Whew! Blood. Everybody looks at the hell. It's not like if you stand up and say, well, today I'm going to preach on forgiveness. Whew! Blood leaves everybody's face. You see, beloved, we find this all throughout Scripture. And in Joshua chapter 7, most of you have heard me talk about that a lot. And that's after, you know, the Israelites had seen some great victory. They would get ready to march into Ai. And when they march into Ai, Joshua said, hey, you know what? This is just a little battle. Just take a handful of soldiers with you. Go take care of it. And they came back thoroughly defeated. And the first thing they did was they responded to that physical defeat by seeking the spiritual answer and calling on God. First thing they did was got on their face and cried out to God. Very first thing they did. And we find that throughout the scriptures, beloved. There was a time, and, and I was just reading this the other day, and so they go into it, look into all these Old Testament examples. And there was a time that a, a lady was, was raped, to kind of cut the short story here, short here. And they were going to deal with that. And then the Benjaminites said, No, you're not going to deal with it. We're going to fight them with this. And, and they began to get work. And they called out to God and they saw God. And God said, Go get them. Go, go march in the battle. You think, well, they walked right into the victory. No, they were defeated. They got that and they gone. Should we do that again? God said, yeah, go get them. And they marched in and they were defeated. They came back the third time. And you can draw what conclusions you want. But on the third time, they prayed and they fasted. Amen. And they said, God, we inquire of you again. Should we go into that battle? Yes. And God says, yes. At that time, they won. Amen. They marched in that battle three times. Two times they were defeated. The third time they went in after fasting and they won the victory. You may say, Pastor, that doesn't seem, I don't understand that. Well, if you remember right in Matthew chapter 17, when the, when the, the disciples couldn't cast a demon out, and Jesus did, what did he say? This kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. In other words, beloved, the Word of God teaches us very simply, there are battles we will not see victories in without fasting. Storm, 
And Paul went on the fast. And after Paul went on that fast, he came and an angel showed up to him and told him that the ship would be open, that, when, when, that they were going to live, all of them on the ship were going to live. Paul went forth with that message. But you see, like, I think I see a pattern here. It seems to me like they prayed and fasted in times of trouble in the Old Testament. It seems to me like John the Baptist and his disciples, they fasted often. It seems to me if we look at the life of Jesus that he fasted often. And it seems to me when we get into the early church that fasting was part of their life. The problem is we just covered the entire Bible. So if the entire Bible shows God's people coming to him in prayer and fasting, apparently maybe God meant for us to do it too. Maybe he meant for it to be a regular part of our life too. Maybe when I'm preaching on seeking God, we have to throw fasting in there. Maybe we, we, there are victories in our life that we're not seeing because we're a people that don't really understand fasting very well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I get a shot out of what? Goodness gracious, it looks like I take pictures. <laughs> it ain't that bad, guys. <laughs> Man, yes. You know what? Pastor, that 
be a good question, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, why would I push myself away from the dinner table? Why would I not eat? And I showed you with that, kind of did that illustration, tried to. Um, but the basic idea, one of the things is, is we just hear from God better. And when I, and I'll share this in just a moment. Let me why this ask. But let's go to Matthew chapter 6. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Verses 16 through 18. Moreover, when you fast, wait a second, the Lord made a mistake there. It's supposed to say, if you fast. It says, when you fast. Why does it say, if you fast? I'm assuming he'd be the assurance, he's assuming we fast. He says, when you fast. He doesn't say, if you fast. So he's a, apparently Jesus is assuming that it's part of a Christian's life. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily unto you, I say, they have their reward. Now, don't, don't do it because you want to show everybody how religious you are. You know, and you may say, why would anybody do that? Oh, trust me, I've been around people like that. Oh, Pastor, I've been fasting for 137 days. How many days have you ever fasted? What happened? I mean, there are people who want to make a big show out of things. And then, you know, come in, and, you know, I can come in here, and I can barely drag myself in and stand up in the pulpit and say, Oh, guys, I've been fasting for so long, I can't hardly preach today. Oh, the pastor's so holy. You see, there are people who want to make a show of things. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Hey, don't do this to impress anybody. Don't do this to, to put on a big show. And you know, one of the things you find in, in life and in, in ministry, and you know, and I don't mean it to be mean, and please don't take this personal. Uh, but you know, one of the things in churches sometimes the people who make the biggest shows are the ones who live it the least. You know, the person, woo, shouts the loudest. Person, amen, Gloria. Maybe the person that's really not living it that well. And that's just a fact. I mean, you know, the, the, the one thing that many pastors understand that, you know, the person who comes into the church and hears you preach twice and tells you how great of a preacher you are, and then, you know, God has brought me across the planet Earth to thought, bring me to this home. You're my pastor. You're the greatest thing ever. This is the most glorious church. Look out to my coming back. Person can't make an IQ quick. The most boisterous are quite often the ones who really aren't living. And, and you'll see people fall prey to that. People will come in here and think, boy, during worship service, whoa, yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. Everybody's on bed, boy, they love God, don't they? I don't know, they just shout a lot. I'll tell you if, I love, if they love God or not when I watch your life for a little bit. You see, Jesus said that that doesn't impress him. If we're fasting just to make a big show and to impress the rest of the congregation, then Jesus said, you know, don't even bother. Don't waste your time. If that's your motivation, to be religious, don't waste your time. You see, there's a prerequisite to fast that our heart has to be right and our motivation has to be right. Otherwise, if you fast with the wrong amount of motivation, can I give you a great deep revelation? You're going hungry. You're not doing anything else. You're just not eating. Fasting this is a great mystery. Fasting is not eating. But not eating is not necessarily fasting. I mean, there are people who don't eat, but they're not fasting. Right? I mean, there are people who are going hungry. There have been times in my life when I didn't eat, I wasn't fasting. You see, it's a matter of the motivation of the heart. You with me on that? But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and force thy face. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto the Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now there is something that will throw us a little bit. If you fast in secret, God will reward you openly. Wait, wait a second, Pastor. You just said my motivation had me right. Now you're telling me Jesus said that I should fast in order to receive a reward. Absolutely. If you're fasting, you better be fasting to receive a reward. Well, that don't sound very holy to me. I just want to fast because I love God. That's not what the Word says. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says that if we come to God, we have to believe that if we diligently seek Him, we'll be rewarded. See, a lot of people have a hard time with that. A lot of people have a hard time, well, then wait a second. If I'm fasting just to be rewarded, is 
fasting just to receive a reward. And I'm not, I'm just being selfish. If I stood up here today and said, you know what, I'm, all, I'm going on the fast next week, I'm going to fast X amount of days, and I'm doing that just so I can be rewarded. You think, well, you're being selfish. No, I think if you're asking me that question, you may be selfish. Don't be offended now. Just stick with me for a minute. Because I'm going to challenge the way you think here in just a second. Isn't that selfish? Well, what kind of rewards are you thinking? Because the mere fact that we think, well, that would be selfish, you're assuming that I'm expecting a selfish reward. You're assuming that I may want some kind of reward, and it's like, you know, so I can live like a rock star. You know? And I'm going to challenge the way you think on this a little bit. Because if we're thinking that fasting for reward is selfish, then we're misunderstanding why we are fasting. Is that sinking in yet? And I said, what are you getting at, Pastor? Go to Isaiah chapter 58. They went on, but your reward. You want a new car? Not necessarily, but that, I'm going to show you that would be okay. Do you want a million dollars? Well, no, but I'm going to show you that would be okay too. Am I looking at me like I'm crazy now? That's what you get your out there. You tell me if you prayed and you fasted for a reward of a million dollars, that wouldn't be selfish. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Isaiah 58. I'm just saying, it depends on how you're looking. Let's go to Isaiah 58, verse 6. What's your motivation for fasting? Isaiah 58, to kind of set the, the scene, is the Israelites have been preparing to fasting, and God's not answering them, they're complaining. God, we've been fasting, and nothing's happening. I've been fasting, God, and I'm not seeing any results. And God says, well, let me instruct you on how to fast so you will see some of the most amazing results that you've ever imagined. Beyond our comprehension. Let me show you how you can pray and fast today and affect generations. Verse 6. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness? To undo the heavy burdens? And to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke. Now let me ask you this: there, 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 what, what he said there that loose the bands of wickedness, undo heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke. Doesn't that sound to you like deliverance? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound to you like people in bondage being set free? So you're telling me that if we pray and fast and we expect to be rewarded by seeing people set free from drug addiction, that's selfish? You're telling me that if I pray and fast and expect somebody to be delivered from alcoholism that I'm being selfish? You're telling me if I pray and fast for somebody who's in some kind of sickness and disease and that's my open reward to see that result that I'm being selfish? You're telling me if I pray and fast for people out here who are lost without Jesus to be born again and I'm openly rewarded by seeing their salvation that I'm being selfish? You see, the mere fact that we think that way tells you that we are thinking wrong about fasting. You're looking at me being rewarded as being something that I'm looking for my own selfish purposes. If you're even thinking about that on a fast, you're wasting your time. I've never, I'm not fasting for me. There's a couple things that I commonly will go on a fast about. Commonly. The most common two things that I, reasons that I fast are one or two. Either in my preparation to preach and teach to you, I'm struggling and I'm not hearing from God clearly. So I will go into a time of fasting, whether it be a meal, two meals, three meals, a day two, whatever it is, to where I hear clearly again. So that I can stand up and feed you what you need to hear spiritually. My only reward that I see is to see that taking place. Now, is that 
selfish? One of the other main reasons that I don't go into the time of fasting is if we have stagnant church services. I can't stand that. Can't put up with it. Can't stand it. If the Spirit of God is not moving in our service, I'll guarantee you I'm fasting quick. Until I know the breakthrough's there, and the Spirit of God begins to move. So am I being selfish because I want to see the Spirit of God move next? My only reward is the moving of the Holy Spirit. My only reward is revelation of God's work to give to you. My open reward is seeing the captives set free. My open reward is seeing sick people healed. My open reward is seeing people born again. That's my open reward. So if I know that God's praying and fasting, expecting to be openly rewarded, you may come here and you may come into a service, the court service has been dead lately, and boom, all of a sudden God moves and you don't even know what's happened. That's an open reward for me when I just did in secret. Or maybe it's you doing that. I'm not saying it's me. I'm just saying my personal life. I'm sharing with you my personal prayer life. Not to elevate me, but to, uh, to illustrate the point. Maybe you're the one doing it. Well, let's look at something else. Well, that's easy to understand, Pastor. I mean, you know, remember the time of the, the lady who was bowled over for 18 years and, and the Pharisees fell up tight because Jesus healed them? And Jesus said, ought not this woman be a daughter of Abraham being set free? Well, let me ask you this question. Ought not those people out there who Christ has died for be born again? Ought not those people out there whose Christ has died so they can be healed be healed? Ought not those people out there who Christ has died so they can be set free be set free? So that's not, a, that's not wrong to ask for that as a reward. Okay, let's take this a little bit farther. Isaiah 58, 7. Now here we're going to get nervous on me. What if I pray for a million dollars? Pray and fast out of a million dollars. Say, well, now you are getting selfish. That depends. What does Isaiah 58, 7 say? Look at Isaiah 58, 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? That thou bring the poor that are cast out of thy house, and thou seest the baby, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh, that's your family. So it says here, I'm supposed to feed the hungry. It says here, I'm supposed to house the poor. It says here, I'm supposed to give people clothing when they need it. You know, one of the things that throughout history with the church that has really hindered us is there's a prejudice in a lot of people. A lot, a lot of people are prejudiced against rich people. They think that because they have money, they they got it through evil means. And a lot of people have been a lot of teaching in the body of Christ that it's ungodly to have wealth. Well, let me ask you a question: If we're all poor, how are we going to feed the poor? <coughs> If we're all poor, how are we going to house homes? If we're all poor, how are we going to give clothing to people who need it? I mean, how many is it? I mean, you know, it doesn't need to be me, but in all honesty, so if I'm praying and I'm fasting and I'm looking for an open reward that's financial, then that's not necessarily wrong, is it? Let me, let me ask you this question. What does love do with money? Would it be wrong for love to have a million dollars? So the problem is, if we're worried about money being evil, it's because we're afraid, apparently, we're going to do selfish things with it. If, if we're going to have riches, and we're going to house the homeless, and we're going to feed the poor, and we're going to give clothing to those who need it, I mean, is it wrong for me that we sent Bibles to Africa? Is it wrong for me that I sent the pastors over their study materials? Is that wrong? Yeah. Well, it takes money to do that. I mean, it takes a hundred bucks now this in Africa. So, if I pray for money, am I wrong? No. In other words, what I'm getting at, you know, I'm using these points to illustrate something. It's the motivation of the heart that's the point here. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us in that passage. It's the motivation of the heart. Why are you fasting? Are you fasting just because you want to get a special spiritual blessing to tickle your feet? 
Are you fasting? Are we as a church? Would we fast because we're concerned about the people out there who are in bondage? Would we fast because we're concerned about people out there who are going to hell? Would we fast because we're concerned about people out there who are, who are dying from some terrible disease? Would we fast because we're concerned about people out there? Would we fast because we need to see breakthroughs financially so we can do what God's Word says, so we can feed the poor? Would we fast so we can house the homeless? Would we fast so we can could do all these things that God lays out? You see, beloved, unless we have a motivation of love, then we're not fasting. That's what Jesus is. That's what God's trying to do. This is God's chosen fast. And yes, he will reward you openly for a heart that is motivated by love. Because as a matter of fact, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13. Hallelujah. But as a matter of fact, anything we do, love has to be the motivation. Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, that's love in the King James, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I can have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I have nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. So unless we first have a heart of love as our motivation and fasting, it doesn't do any good. You're just going hungry. You're just doing without food. That's not God's chosen fast. God's chosen fast is when we as a body come to the place, we realize, you know what? We, 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 we are overwhelmed with the devastation that's taking place around us. And we are desperate to see God's hand move. And we've come to a place where we realize that there's nothing that no man can do. But we've got to see God move. And if that requires us praying and fasting, we're willing to pay the price because we're motivated. If we need finances to take the gospel to the entire world, and it requires praying and fasting, we will pray and fast. Because we're motivated by love for the lost and dying world. You see, everything comes into place when love is truly our motivation. Then we can read these things and completely different. Go back to Matthew chapter 6 and let me illustrate my point to you. Make sure that the motivation of the heart is right. 
Because God says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. God says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that, that, that He will pour out His love into our heart by His Holy Spirit. Step one in fasting is not stopping eating. Step one in fasting is doing a motivational check between you and God. And say, God, fill my heart with your love. Let my motivation be love. And let God reward you openly. Amen? Amen. So that's the first thing we do in a fast, is check our motivation. So let's just take a moment here, and we'll have me to come to the keyboard and just, hallelujah. Let the Holy Spirit do a work. Let's all stand. Allow the Spirit of God to move.